So I'm going to be talking about this today. Okay? Managing your internal board and external board of directors. Now, I know you all know what an external board of directors is. You've probably got an inkling about what your inner board of directors is as well. Now, if you don't manage a board, this is talk still going to be relevant to you. Okay? Still going to be a lot to learn, because the same could be true of managing your senior team, managing your employees. The concepts will be the same. Okay, a little show of hands then. Hands up if you've checked your email during one of the talks that have happened today. Honestly, I've done it, All right? It's about half of you. It's pretty good going. I'm very impressed. Normally, if I ask a question like this, there'd be a lot more people. Why? It's like, surely people you work with know that you're at a conference. Surely there's nothing that important that's come in within the last 20 minutes or so in terms of that, yet you've done it, Okay. And it's probably something, if you've just checked it in the last 20 minutes or so, something you do quite frequently. You probably check your email five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve 10, 12 times a day, okay? Something maybe you've never thought about. How many of you know it's probably not a good idea to be checking your email during a conference talk? Show of hands. All right? So on the one hand, you've got this conflict here, thinking, well, I might miss something. If I don't check my email, I'm going to miss something. Or that time many years ago, I didn't check my email and something slipped through. Or that time I luckily enough checked my email before I went to bed on Saturday night and this email had come in and I did something about it and crisis was averted. Is that you've, part of you, an internal board of your direct, one of your boards of directors, tells you that this has been a good thing in your life. Okay? Yet there's another part of you in conflict with that, maybe the core of you, telling you that it's a bad idea. Okay. Other, board, other people on my board of um, directors. I have what I like to call the furious worker. And the furious worker is a great ally on my board. The furious worker comes in and gets, helps me get shit done. Okay? I worked with a, um, a founder fairly recently, actually, and um, it was quite a, a period of high growth at the organization. One Friday, he finished work early. Came back on the Monday morning, absolutely proud. He's like, do you know what I've done over the weekend, folks? Guys, I've designed a brand new feature for the app. I've spent the whole weekend designing and building this amazing feature for the app. I worked like 12 hours both days to do this. This amazing new feature's in. Here it is. And he presented this to, the, again, an engineering team of about, about 20 engineers at that point. And they were all like, what, what have you done? And this furious worker had been something that had stood him in great stead early on when he was an early stage startup founder. Okay? The furious worker is what helped him produce and build the most amazing startup in the world. But again, there's a dark side of that, that that skill that he'd used, his furious worker came in and took over when he was in periods of stress or periods of challenge or periods of problems. Anybody else got a, a furious worker out there? That when you're a little bit stressed, you sort of work really hard on something without really knowing what you're working on or why you're working on it? Okay? Again, it's a board of directors that's helped us probably at some point in the past, but again, we now know that probably it's not a good idea, and it certainly isn't if you've got a family to be working all weekend on a brand new feature. Again, it's useful, and it's somebody that's great to have on your side, but again, not somebody you really, really want to be taking over when things get really, really difficult. And I have another <laughs> board of directors, a member of my board of directors. This is Imp. Imp is my imposter syndrome, and Imp's with me here on the stage today, and has been whispering in my ear all day, God, Joe, you're not good enough to be doing this. What are you doing on stage here? People are going to think you're awful at this. What's going on? You're not, you're not worthy of being up there. Anybody else have a, an imposter syndrome in their background as well? So it's something we all know, okay? Now, imp has caused me great problems today in terms of making me quite nervous before I went on stage. If you've seen me pacing beforehand, you know that I was quite nervous. I'm fine now. But imp is also the person that's helped me build a great, a, book, a great presentation. I didn't start this last night at 12 o'clock the night before I'm doing all night, I pull an all night to write the presentation. Imps help me, give me the time to improve what I'm doing. So again, there's a good side and a dark side to one of my directors, which again is, is Imp. Um, this is one of my favorites, actually. Uh, another one of my board of directors. Again, that I hear about from, from a lot of founders that I work with. This is the one that's, um, everything's going to be all right if I can just earn or just exit and get 10 million. Anybody familiar with this one? If I just can get this business in, or I can just get this big deal, if I can get the next £100,000 worth of business, or if I can sell this company for £10 million, everything's going to be fine. Anybody had that feeling? If I can just earn a lot of money and exit, great, everything's going to be fine. And this money chaser for me has caused me great problems in my life, okay, alongside the furious worker. So I founded a startup in 2018. I've not talked about this publicly, by the way, so this is a bit of a big deal for me. Um, three friends of mine, um, three co-founders. We raised quite a lot of money <laughs> and 
we immediately, the three of us, when we raised money for this business, realized it was a bad idea, that we shouldn't be doing this, that we weren't set out to be founders in quite that way. And we gave the money back. And it was a big deal for me in my life when that happened. And I, you know, set myself up as a failure. The imposter syndrome was coming in. All of these things were going through my head. But what was going on at this point was this part of me was talking. This, this board member of my board of directors was speaking to me right there and then and saying, look, if you just found a unicorn, everything's going to be fine. If you get, find a billion-dollar company, everything's going to be fine in your life. I mean, how hard is that? I mean, ridiculous voices and these things these, these boards of directors tell us in our life. And what's, what's the problematic about this particular member of the board as well? This is based a lot around anxiety, which we all know. Okay? And this also can be exacerbated by cultural events in the world, like you know, COVID-19 or wars that are happening around us. That can spur on these elements of some of our board of directors and make this feeling more acute. Final one then, and again, maybe one you can talk about here. I, I suffer from dyslexia and have done, obviously, since I was born. Um, and dyslexia has always been a part of me, but it's always been a part of me that's driven me to do much more. Been a lot of me around, screw you, you know, all to my teachers. Do you think I can't do it because I'm a bit stupid? No, I'm going to show you what I can do. Okay. Anybody else dyslexic here or identify themselves as neurodiverse, ADHD or autism or something like that? Okay, again, it's a board of directors that can stand you in great stead when they're on your side, but when they're not on your side can cause you great problems in life. So these are my internal board of directors. And what's interesting about the, good, the bad side of them, which I've talked about here, there's also the good side. So this is Temple Gradin talking about autism right here. And I love this quote. She's fantastic. And this is absolutely true of everybody in this room, okay? When we are great people talking and chatting, but we're also people who are very focused on what we do in terms of building tech and SaaS companies as well, okay? If we weren't doing what we're doing, if we didn't have elements of the autism spectrum on what we do, we would get nothing done. So again, lots of these boards of directors, our internal board of directors, can be people that can help us and support us throughout. So here's my internal board of directors. Okay? I've got about 10 more, and I'm always on the lookout for them. But they've helped me be the success that I am. And also at points in my life, they've caused me to hold me back from all of those difficult situations and challenges that perhaps I should have jumped into. So they're both protectors, but they're also enablers for me. And what's interesting about when I talk again to a lot of the founders that I work with is when we talk about their external board or their board of directors, there's a lot of fear there. Okay? So when I talk to a lot of the founders I work with, this is what I hear when they talk about their board of directors, their actual board of directors, their external board of directors. Okay? They say things to me like, I hate board meeting, I hate the board meeting, I hate the grilling. I don't think it's fair to put my senior team in front of the board. They want to protect their senior team from that. Honestly, I'm intimidated every time. I hate the preparation and the detail I need to go in. Okay? So I hear lots of fear and worry, particularly around the board meeting. And this is typically from around founders when they've hit kind of series A, they've taken some significant investment and they have to get very serious about the board of directors they take on. It starts to become a burden to them and a challenge, but not in the right way for them. It's something they're worried and intimidated about. It, again, it doesn't have to be like this. It doesn't have to be like this at all. And so you can start Googling for how to deal with this, okay? And that's the best place to start for all of us. That's where we start. If there's not an article on Stack Overflow. Maybe there's something in the Harvard Business Review about how to manage a board. And you come up with articles like this, okay, from this very smart Yale professor, Jeffrey Sonnenfeld. And he says, you know, in this Harvard Business Review article, which is called What Makes a Great Board, this is what he tells you to do, okay? It's not about tightening procedural rules. It's about to be a strong, high-functioning work group whose members trust and challenge one another, engage directly with senior managers on critical issues facing corporations. And you're like, great, thanks, Jeff, but what does that actually mean? How do you do this? And every time I read articles like this, and there's so many of them out there when it comes to managing business and managing the world of business, you read so much of this stuff. They tell you what you should be doing, but not how to do it. And it reminds me very much of this, this image. You know this one? You know, it's like... <laughs> Classically, this is many, many Harvard Business Review articles, all right? They're always like this. And then you ask them, well, give me the depth here. Well, what's the depth to do this sort of stuff? And the depth simply isn't there, okay? They're just asking you to draw the fucking owl, okay? Let's talk about that today then. So let's talk about situations of, of managing a board. So how do we do this? So let's take a typical board. This is the board of a fintech SaaS startup, okay? They've taken some venture money. They've been told to get a board of experienced industry veterans to help direct and manage the business. And I'm going to talk about four specific directors that are on this board. 
Okay? They're all stereotyped, um, but they're all based on examples of actual board members that I've met and that I've worked with and the people that I've met and uh, that I coach have, have worked with as well. So if you've got a board like this, I do apologize now. Nobody's board is probably this intense, but you can get some examples of some of the things you're going to hear from your board. So let's talk about the first one. This is the insurance bigwig. So this is a CEO. She's um, now in semi-retirement. She was CEO of a, a, an insurance company in the UK for many years. She uh, has exited and she's had a strong career of building a solid process-driven insurance companies. Okay, great, something great to have on board. Okay, and you present to her and you say, hey, things are going well at our business. Here's the sort of things that she's going to say back to you. Okay, we need to consolidate and protect. We need to minimize risk and we need more process. Ever come across anybody like this? Often, if you're hiring a senior management team for the first time, you can hire people like this, okay? They'll come in and they'll say, we need more process. You've probably heard this time and time and time again. So why, why is she saying this? Where's this coming from? Insurance. The insurance business. This is what they do. That, I mean, if you hire a big wig from an insurance business, you're going to hear this, okay? So there's no great surprise there. But again, it's hard to know what to do about that. This is all this person says to you. Now, she's built her whole career on this. This is her winning strategy, is to implement process, to consolidate and protect, and to minimize risk. Her whole career, this has been her winning strategy. So this is what she's going to tell you to do. Challenging, really challenging. And we can define her as simply being a classic type of a manager here. Okay? This is what managers do. They manage and talk about risk. Okay. Others then, we have the Merrill Lynch executive. I've deliberately chosen Merrill Lynch here because it's a bank that isn't around anymore. Let's talk about the Merrill Lynch executive. This is the things they're telling you when things are going well. The team is too inexperienced. Our competitors are breathing down our neck. What more could we be doing to improve this stuff right now? Okay? So a driven person coming from a very driven financial institution. That's where this person is coming from. Okay? So you understand what that advice is and what that support is that this person is telling you right here. And this is often, um, we can describe this person as being a critic. Okay? They're telling you things that are not great about the work that you're working on. They're telling you the weaknesses of what you are. And again, this is really useful stuff for you to hear, but it's no doubt that many of the people I work with say things like this. If that's what they're hearing from their board, is we need more process, we need to do more, you know, we should, our competitors are breathing down our neck. This is great advice from the right sorts of people at the right time, but it's really strongly intimidating if you're a first-time founder, certainly a first-time CEO, sit in the position of being told these things by these people. It's really challenging to be put in this position. Okay, let's keep going. So other people then, who are probably more on your side, we have the veteran founder, okay? Anybody have a veteran founder on their board? So people who've come in and exited before, okay. Again, fantastic people to have because they've got some amazing experience, okay? And here's some of the things you can hear from them. We need to work harder. We need to expand. Okay? Similarly, they've got a very similar playbook for the success that they've worked on. Typically, that's built around working hard, working long, and expanding and, and, and growing in terms of what we're doing. That's how they've built their business. That's where this is coming from for these folks. And then finally, we have the uh, non-exec co-founder. Okay? In fact, before we talk about him, we can define this, these, these folks as firefighters. Okay? They're amazing people to have on their side. And when there's a problem, having somebody like a veteran founder on site can be amazing for your, the strength of your company because they are there and they are going to work hard for you on your behalf. Having a firefighter on your team is a fantastic person to have. Okay. Then finally, we have the non-exec co-founder. So a non-exec co-founder is, again, somebody who's got some equity but perhaps is not on the executive board anymore. And they're saying things to you, things like this. We need to fire the underperformers. And wouldn't it be great if we blockchained, AI'd, rocket powered it? Ever had getting advice like this recently from anybody on your board? You know, sprinkle a little bit of blockchain in there, wave the AI stick at it. Let's just AI it, rocket power it. Again, these are the sorts of things you can hear from your board members. And again, obviously this means nothing. And you, as smart tech founders, know it is not that simple. But again, this is the sort of advice that you can end up getting from your internal board members. Again, extremely, very, very extreme. But again, you've got to understand and know how to manage these things. Okay? 
And these non-exec co-founders are typically called the exiles. And they're exiled for a particular reason. Because again, if somebody's telling you to blockchain it all the time and it, AIing it and rocket powering it and firing everybody, that's not somebody you want on your executive team, but there's still somebody you end up having to work with. And you can see the value there because they're going to come and they're going to occasionally sprinkle some fairy dust of some amazing ideas for you. So there's real value. But again, how do you manage challenging, difficult people like this? And so the first thing you could think about is, well, we can just ignore them, right? Think, great advice. Thank you very much. And ignore it. But, but what happens if we ignore these, very, these four very strong personalities? What's going to happen? Are they going to sit down and take that, hold their tongue? No. They absolutely are not. And you can end up with a situation like this where they start shouting louder and louder and louder. If you ignore them, if you don't, don't take on their advice, they're going to shout louder and louder and louder. And this is at the point where they do get more challenging for a founder, where they do start to really be much more critical of everything you're doing. They're critical anyway, but they're doing it at a much more of a lead, the questioning your leadership skills, questioning the position you're in, questioning all of these things that you do not need if you try and squash them down and you don't listen to them. Okay, so we have these four folks on our board, okay? All extremely useful, giving us very strong advice exactly when we need it, but again, always we can see the dark side of where these folks have come from, the advice that they're trying to give us here. Okay. So what happens in the converse then when things aren't going as well as expected? What's the advice you get from these folks when things are a bit wobbly or things aren't going well? What do you hear from them? Let's start with the first one, and the Merrill Lynch exec, aka the critic. What do they tell you when things aren't going well? This, which is extremely useful. I told you so. Competitors are breathing down your neck. You should have done this. You should have done this. This is your critic here, and your board member being a critic, telling you I told you so. Okay? And that's, again, strengthening their position. Now, their advice may not have been the right advice for you to take when things were going well, but when things are going badly, they're going to tell you you should have taken their advice. And again, they win power over you, and it strengthens that winning strategy that they've already got. It strengthens their position based on what they think they know from before. And then you hear from the insurance... Um, insurance veteran, the insurance bigwig. Okay? We need to consolidate and protect. We need to minimize risk. We need more process. So when things are going badly, their winning strategy comes out again. And this is true of so many of us humans. Okay? When things are going well, we have a winning strategy, and that winning strategy is what drives us forward. That gets strengthened and strengthened and strengthened in us. And then when things go badly, what do we do? We go back to our winning strategy and hope that that's going to help us get through this. Okay? Most executives do this. Most humans do this. Okay? Now, again, for a senior person within insurance, short of the 2008 financial crisis, it's probably not too much of a challenge that they've ever really faced on a large scale. Certainly not the challenges they're facing in the organizations you're in and the size of the businesses you're in right now. It's not the same sort of thing for them. Okay? So when they come back with their winning strategy, when things are going bad, they'll tell you the same thing, which is not, very what, not exactly what you need. The same is true of the... Um, the veteran founder, we need to work hard and we need to expand. They'll tell you the same things about how to do it, because again, that's their winning strategy. The same is true of the exile. We should have blockchained it. Let's blockchain it now. We need to fire them into Palmas. The advice is the same when things are good and when they're bad. And so the question comes then, what do we do about this? Okay? This is the advice we're going to get from these folks. We need to understand where it's coming from, what it is. How do we deal with this? So here's some very, very simple advice. Okay? Listen and thank them for their comment. Always listen and say thank you for your input there. Okay? <laughs> it ain't rocket science, but believe me, just thank them for their input. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Okay? And then understand why are they saying this to you? Sincere. No, that's extra. <laughs> of course, you need to sound sincere. Was that not sincere when I said thank you then? You yeah. should work on sincerity skills. Understand why they're saying this to you. Okay? Where's it coming from? What's the point of them reasoning? What's their background? Why are they saying, where is this coming from? Understanding why, what their winning strategy is and why they are giving you the advice they are giving you. Okay? Understanding that from where it is. And then obviously asking the question, is this the right thing to do? Ask yourself that. Okay? Is this the right thing I should be doing at this point? Really questioning, is this the right thing we should be doing? Talking to the rest of your executive team about this. Taking this advice on board rather than dismissing it or thinking it's not relevant. Is this the right thing to do right now? Okay? Dealing with these difficult situations and challenges. And then obviously deciding what you should do based upon that as well. But again, the key is listening, understanding, understanding where that's come from, taking that forward. This is the right thing to do. Is the thing we should be doing going forward. Okay? Listen to these folks. Because again, 
there is a winning strategy that each of them have got. Understanding what that winning strategy is can help you build and grow and strengthen your business. When things aren't going well, you can understand why they're telling you that particular winning strategy and if you should listen to that winning strategy by understanding the context of where they've come from. Okay? So you get these four examples of types of directors that sit on your board. Okay. You all know this gentleman, do you? Yeah, of course so. Would you like Elon Musk on your board? Hey, there's lots of reasons why it'd be great and lots of reasons why it wouldn't. Now, we can take that same criteria that we've used for our external board and we can start to look at our external board again. So if, if Elon Musk was going to be on your, on your board, which type of, of board member would he be? Which of these do you think he would fit to? Is he a manager? Consolidate and protect and process? Doesn't strike me that at all. Which ones of these is he? Excel. Definitely an exile, crazy ideas. What, which else? Well, honestly, he's probably all of them. I could have spent ages building this slide. Look at him. I mean, look, he's, he's, he's built a flamethrower. He's telling you, test te the stock price is too high, in my opinion. Why has he done that? Was he that clever? Is, it, I mean, is that really what he's doing? I mean, the question, again, is does he really think about what he's doing before he tweets Elon Musk? There's other tweets he said where he, he says that he, he tweets 50% of his tweets are when he's on the toilet having a poo, all right? That's one of his tweets. So what's interesting about Elon Musk and what you see about this is lots of these types are coming through from him. He's not just one type of person, okay? He's not just uh, um, an exile. He's also a critic. Tesla stock price is too high, okay? He's also an exile because obviously he's telling you to build, you know, he's, how much effort is being put into him building a flamethrower for one of his businesses when he could be, you know, building an amazing electric car company or putting people onto Mars, there's a lot going on with the different types that he is in terms of his personality. And once you start to see the directors of others, you can start to see yours as well. So we've spotted some, and I've pointed out some of the ones of Elon Musk right here. And it can start to help you understand how people have built some, the successes that they have. You can start to understand how Elon Musk has built his success because he is like this. Okay? He has crazy ideas. I'm going to build a space company and send people to the moon. I mean... If somebody was to tell you that, that's a crazy idea. That comes from a, a place of an exile who's coming up with amazing ideas that need to push everything forward. But again, it works for Elon Musk for so many different reasons. And so you start to see these boards of directors and other people, you can start to see them in yourself too. So here's Justin Can. He's the founder of, um, of Twitch, which he sold for a billion dollars. And what's interesting about this is you look at him and you understand that he's a, he... Part of him, one of his directors, is imposter syndrome. Right? Yet, yeah, he's built a billion dollar company and sold a billion dollar company. And it comes back to the idea that your external board of directors can both be an amazing thing to help drive you forward, but can also be holding you back. The same is true of your inner board of directors, too. Is imposter syndrome is a feature, not a bug, for so many of us. It makes us work harder, think harder, prepare harder to do the things that we should be doing. It's not something that's stopping us, and it can be something that stops us, but it's a feature as much as it is a bug. And so we read things from people about squashing imposter syndrome or banishing their ADHD. It's by embracing these parts of you that's going to help you be stronger and be better at what you do. These are the parts of you, these are the directors of you that have made you the success that you are. Now, they shouldn't be driving you all of the time, because again, if imposter syndrome was driving me right now, I would not be here. But imposter syndrome has helped me be better, much better at what I do. In fact, there's a great talk from um, Jason Cohen of WP Engine from, here, from Boss 2017 about healthy, wealthy, and wise, where he talks about a different lens of looking at these things in as well. Fantastic. And he comes up again with some similar examples. So this is not who um, famously uh, sold um, uh, Minecraft. Thank you. So again, this is back to my internal board of directors. It's understanding here. I'm going to mix my metaphors quite brilliantly here. So here's my internal board of directors. And I ask you the question of who's driving the bus at any one point in terms of these as well. So by understanding and identifying your internal board of directors, you can understand who is driving the bus at any one time. I mentioned if my imposter syndrome was here right now, I wouldn't be on the stage. Okay? There's lots of these. It's about control and how these come out and when these come out. So... You recognize this from a couple of weeks ago. So this is Will Smith at the Oscars when Chris Rock said something quite disparaging about his wife. 
He stood up, came to the stage, slapped him. Please don't repeat that today, okay? Hopefully I won't say anything that's going to offend you that much, okay? But we can start to look at this incident through the lens of what I've just talked about here as well. So the things I've been talking about here today, managing external board and more importantly managing your internal board, is based on a theory called internal family systems by a gentleman called Dr. Richard Schwartz. Fantastic stuff, okay? He's a therapist, has been for many years. He looks at trauma specifically. This is quite deep stuff. What's interesting about this, as I mentioned, I've got a background in psychology. My background's in, in neuroscience, in fact. There's a lot of amazing science behind this stuff. And his book is called No Bad Parts, which is, again, the same as what I've been saying to you here as well. There's no bad directors on your internal board of directors. There's nobody there that's bad, intrinsically bad. They all bring value to what it is that you do. Okay? Be that your imposter syndrome, your dyslexia, your furious worker, they all bring value to you at some point. But again, you've got to be making sure that that particular director or part isn't driving the bus or being aware of who's doing that at any one time. Now, what's interesting and amazing about this theory is when you start to look at what happens when you take away these onion layers of all these, these parts and these directors is you end up seeing what's underneath. And what's underneath here is what they call the true self. And what's interesting about that is you look at these words here, and these words are, these nine C's are great words to, to live by, as a leader, as a human being, generally. You know, Curiosity, compassion, clarity, connectedness, creativity, courage, confidence, calm. I get people approaching me wanting things like clarity. I know that organizations that are extremely successful have a high amount of curiosity about their customers. Okay? To be a great parent and husband or wife or even indeed employer, compassion is extremely important to you. Okay? So there's lots of amazing things that sit underneath our friends here, our internal board of directors. And they can get in the way of the work that we do, connecting us to our true self underneath. And that's exactly what's going on here. All right? So is Will Smith a violent person? He's, well, it depends on how you look at it. There's a part of him that is. But him as a whole, probably not. But there's a part of him that reacts to situations with violence. Okay? Maybe that's part of his upbringing. Maybe that's come from somewhere in his past. But that part of him, or that director there, that caused him to go onto stage and hit somebody, has come from somewhere. That's been strengthened by an experience he's had in his life that's caused him to realize that that's a strategy that can work. There's a part of him in control here. Now, what's interesting about what happened to Will Smith is this comment that Denzel Washington made to him after, after, directly after this, when he was trying to get him to calm down. Okay? And in your highest moments, be careful, that's when the devil comes for you. And what's interesting about this is you can start to look at other CEOs and other leaders in organizations who've made really bad, awful decisions and start to look at it and go, well, why did they make that choice? Which part of them was talking or which director was talking when that choice was being made? Like you look at the horrific stuff that's happened here in the UK with P&O ferries where they made all their staff redundant on the same day as hiring a whole load of new casual staff. You can look at other huge corporate malfunctions in the past and understand, well, which parts were in control of the leaders of those organizations and what got out of control, okay? So this is what happens when those directors or those parts of you get out of control is you, is you can end up reacting like this, okay? Doing the things that you, you're not happy about, that behavior that doesn't make you strong, like shouting at your staff or doing the things that you know you shouldn't be doing, okay? This stuff can get out of control. But it's understanding, again, who's driving the bus in this situation. And understanding if you take to people, and looping back to that first question they asked you about checking your email, checking your email might seem fairly harmless, something that you do, but you can end up finding yourself doing stuff like, and I've been guilty of this, doing stuff like this, Yeah? <laughs> Checking your phone, checking your Instagram, checking your email when you know you're playing with your kid in the park. You know, or you're supposed to be having some family time at home and you're thinking about work elsewhere. Again, I don't even have to ask you because I know you all have this. All of us do as highly driven people. And this is what can happen when your parts start to take too much control of you, when one of your board of directors is exerting too much control. Now, I talked to you about your external board. The same danger comes from your external board. If they've got too much control, if there's too much process there's too much focus on competition, if there's too much focus on building rocket-powered flamethrowers, you're not going to have a successful business. All of these things come from balance. Any time one of our directors gets out of control, <laughs> internally as well as externally, we need to connect with our inner self and understand how to manage that particular situation. Okay? 
Because these folks, again, have got superpowers. And again, with your internal board of directors, I ask you the same question. What happens if you ignore your internal board of directors? So what happens if you ignore your internal board of directors? For example, let's take the money one who's anxious about money. Okay? It's like, if I just could make 10 million, everything's going to be fine. What happens if you ignore that particular inner board of directors? What happens? Do they go away? The same happens if you ignore it external board of director in the same way. These parts shout at you. They push themselves out in different parts of the day. Maybe that's three o'clock in the morning or at points when you most don't need it. It's that anxiety comes back to haunt you. So again, it's understanding where this is coming from. Okay? It's that part of me that caused me to, you know, led me to start that hopefully billion dollar unicorn when we gave the money back. That was me trying to deal with my anxiety about working hard to, to deliver a unicorn company that I could sell and live off the profit, profits forever. That was driven by my anxiety a lot of that journey, which is the last place I wanted to be as a founder. And so, again, squashing them down means they just come up in other places in most unexpected ways. And again, that's not the way to deal with them. You just do this with your inner board of directors. Listen and thank them for their comment. Might sound kind of strange talking to yourself like this, and now obviously that's the first sign of many other things going on. But again, when you look at the work that, that Dick Schwartz has done, it's all about doing this. It's talking and acknowledging your internal board of directors as well as your external board of directors. Listen and thank them for what they're telling you. Okay? Understand why they're saying this to you. So why do I need 10 million? What, what, what am I most worried about? Why is this happening here? Why are they saying this to me? Is this the right thing to be doing right now? Like, why am I checking my email right now? Where's this coming from? Who's telling me to do this? Is this the right thing to be doing right now? Having that conversation with yourself around that and then understanding and deciding what to do about it. Now, this stuff's not just going to happen overnight. You're talking to your partner. It's a, it's a muscle you need to exercise. Um, but once you start to do it, you start to see more of this in your life. Okay? And to use a, an overused analogy in this world, or the tech world, this is your underlying operating system of these nine Cs. If you can get back to this, if you can get over those parts of you that are in control, or those directors of you that are in control a lot of the time, you can work on your underlying operating system. And this is a lovely place to be if you can really be here. And what's interesting about these nine Cs as well is these are also extremely strong leadership traits. Okay? Who wouldn't want to hire a leader that has all of these things? Okay? Extremely strong leadership traits. And so again, when you're with your external board of directors, you want to be more like this. Right? You don't want to be Will Smith slapping, not, not that you're ever going to do that, or Elon Musk with your crazy flamethrower. But again, having this when it comes to managing your external board, having these nine Cs... You can see how that's going to be there. Of course, your external board of directors want clarity. They want creativity in the things you're working on. They want confidence. They want calm. They want you to be curious about your customers and the business you're in. This is exactly what they want and they need as well. All right? And consequently, if you've got children, you've got kids, this is what they want from you too. Your partner's the same way. It all adds up into the same thing. Okay? So some practical advice, because I realize I've given you quite a lot here of talking about how to manage these teams. So I want to leave you, with, leave you with something extremely practical to manage your external board of directors. Okay. This is a fabulous quote from a great book called The CEO Test. If you've not read it, read The CEO Test if you're a leader. It's fantastic. And this is a great quote from that. This is um, from a gentleman called Dinesh Paliwal, who is the CEO of Harman International, who make hi-fi gear, um, sold to, um, bought by Samsung. And this is great advice. When we go to our board, every business strategy is described in one page with simple messaging. What's the, goal, what's the goal, the core message in one line? What are the three key actions we're taking? So he goes to his board with this every single time. What are the three key challenges we're facing here? How do you measure success in 12 months? He goes to them with this very, very, very simple board overview. One page, extremely simple. All right? Great stuff. Now, again, this is a bit like draw the fucking owl because this is quite difficult to do, okay? But again, I'm giving you guidance on how you, the approaches you need to take a managing board. If you start with this, you're going to be in a much stronger position as you go through. And he goes on to talk about this, actually, okay? My board members read that, and it's much easier for them to understand. Simplifying the message is not an art. It's a practice, and it doesn't happen in one day. It doesn't come naturally to most of us. It's work, and you have to spend time on it. This takes time. It's a muscle that you need to build. You can't expect to get this right all of the time. But it's well worth putting the effort in to do that. And interesting, how the best way to do that is to come back to this again, these nine Cs, is to get to that particular statement. You need the curiosity to understand 
what's going on, what your more challenges are. You need the creativity to understand how you can overcome those challenges. All of these things can help you define and decide this stuff. And also what's interesting about this as well is the word that when I, the people I work with, they come to me, ask, this is the, the stuff we end up working on together when I'm a coach. Is this individually, is, the, is this stuff for the people I work with? Okay? What's the goal, the core message for your business in one line? What's the goal, the core message for yourself? What's the goal, the core message for your relationship? All of this, this can work on so many different levels when you start to break it down, because this is extremely strong, useful advice. Okay. And it can help you deal with these folks as well. If you're giving a very strong core message, and imp and furious worker, and all these folks are getting involved, you can come back to this and go, no, 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 no. <laughs> this is what we're doing, and this is what we're working on. You guys, leave me alone for now. Unless you can help me do this, please leave me alone. And so looping back to that first quote that I started with then, this is the reason why people make great decisions, okay? Is they understand the strengths that come from the directors that they're working with both externally and internally, okay? And that power comes from making a choice based on clarity, connectedness, calm, curiosity, all of those nine C's that I've talked about here, okay? And we could equally swap out the word person here for director or part at this level here. Okay? So when the wrong person's in control, bad decisions get made. Okay? When the smartest person is in control, the right decisions tend to get made at this point as well. How many of the, I mean, how many types of board member do you think people have internally? So I've identified four types there. So I may not have explicitly said it, but there's four types really that we mentioned there. The managers, the firefighters, the um, critics, and the um, exiles. They're all the same examples of internal board members as well. So there's four groupings. There are more four groupings as well that are out there too, but those are the four, the four core ones that Dick Schwartz talks about, and they all fit into those areas as well. So you look at things like the way Will Smith slapped um, Chris Rock, that was a firefighter coming to the fore there. Okay, that was somebody dealing with an extremely difficult, challenging situation. That was his, his a director that was part of him that was a firefighter, just helping him deal with that situation. 